Coming up on this week's episode of the EV Resource Podcast, Lotus goes all in on EVs, Ford reconfirms their EV timeline, Lucid reveals the debut date of their first car, and more. Hello friends and welcome to the EV Resource Podcast. I'm Zach Hurst and each week I bring you the latest EV news, information, and answers to your questions about electric vehicles. Special thanks to Titan Auto and Tire in Mosley, Virginia for their support for this podcast. Titan is one of the very few independent shops in Virginia that are qualified to work on EVs and hybrids. And from hybrids to Hummers, they fix everything. Before we get started with all the great EV news this week, I do want to welcome three new patrons to the EV Resource family, Bruce Ely, Ann Rogers, and Ray Stetkiewicz. Thank you all very much for your support. In addition to helping with this podcast, subscribers to EV Resource on Patreon do additionally get full access to the monthly EV Resource magazine. Uh, if you are interested in joining the bunch and being a part of our family here at EV Resource, you can check us out at patreon.com slash EV Resource. All right, let's get to the news. So we'll start off with some information about Ford and their plans for their electric vehicles. It was very easy to get excited when Ford posted a video of their all-electric F-150 prototype pulling one million pound freight train last year. But while they didn't give any official timeline on when to expect a production version, many people thought that that was going to happen fairly soon. Well, this week we got a little update to Ford's plans when their COO, Jim Farley, said in an interview to CNBC's Squawk on the Street, that the company's first electric pickup truck will be the F-150 and also an electric cargo van, they're going to produce those in mid-2022. So that's two years away. And while that's arguably not soon enough, the fact that they are headed in that direction is certainly cause enough to be uh, excited and to celebrate that. However, they are not going to be the only manufacturer with an EV truck on the road or having plans right now to build an EV truck. Tesla and General Motors both say that they're going to have their electric pickup trucks on sale by the end of next year, 2021. And Nikola and Rivian are looking at 2022 as well as Ford for the release dates for their vehicles. Somewhere in the mix is going to be Lordstown Motors and Bollinger, just to name a few. So the competition is going to be there. And that means Ford's really going to have to bring their A-game. But Ford's upcoming EV plans are not limited only to trucks and vans. Uh, and we found out a lot more information this week about their very exciting upcoming Mustang Mach-E all-electric SUV. It is actually going to be the first Ford vehicle to include their new Active Drive Assist software. That's going to be their version of Tesla's Autopilot or GM's Super Cruise driver assist features. Additionally, they plan on offering what they're calling an intelligent range system that will take a lot more than just your past driving style into account when estimating your remaining range. It's going to also tap into a crowdsourced efficiency information for the road that you're on or the route that you're taking, as well as current weather conditions. So definitely a very advanced uh, feature when looking at estimating how much range you're going to have left in a realistic way. And then lastly this week, Ford also disclosed that they're going to include a free 250 kilowatts of charging at Electrify America Charging Network with every new Mach-E. Now, while the Mach-E is a great vehicle in of itself, and I think it has enough to stand on its own without all of these really neat features, the fact that Ford is including these certainly sweetens the deal for prospective buyers. So next, we'll move on to Lotus. Uh, speaking with Auto Express in the UK, Lotus CEO Philip Popham explained that they are going to completely ditch gas-powered vehicles. They're going to skip hybrid technology and from here on out, go full battery electric vehicles, full EV. Now, to give a recent backstory on Lotus, they have since 2017 been owned by Geely, which is a Chinese company that also owns Volvo. 
And when Geely bought Lotus, it was actually very exciting because what they did with Volvo was basically said, hey, here's a bunch of money. Go do what you want. Build really good cars. Well, Lotus has taken that approach and demonstrated its intent to launch a full electric hypercar called the Avaya. However, that is not going to be one of their mainstream vehicles. Its cost is in excess of 2.4 million pounds, and only 130 of them will ever be built. So now the company's CEO, Philip Popham, has suggested that the next generation of Lotus sports cars are going to completely skip hybrid technology like a lot of other manufacturers have used as a tiptoe into electrification and follow the path set out by the Avaya by becoming fully electric. Speaking exclusively to Auto Express, Popham told them that one thing that Lotus believes in is the future of battery electric vehicles and that their intention is to offer full battery electric versions on all of their products in the future. He said BEV is really suited to sports cars, the torque characteristics, the weight distribution, design, and flexibility of dynamics. And for him, it all leads to battery electric vehicles as the ultimate technology for sports cars. So I think this is great news from Lotus. What the automotive world needs more than anything else right now is to shift away from full gas and diesel vehicles. Hybrids are one of those areas that's kind of gray, depends on who you talk to. For me personally, I think plug-in hybrids are a definite stepping stone for manufacturers to offer to customers that live in a certain area. You know, if a customer has a longer commute or they live far out into the rural areas of a country, they're not going to want to trust a full battery electric vehicle just yet. Is the technology capable of suiting their needs? Most of the time, yes. But it's also going to have to come down to a public awareness aspect, and it's going to take some time before people are going to be comfortable taking the step to full battery electric vehicles. When it comes to Lotus and sports cars, I think that they have the right idea in simplifying the technology that they're working with. Hybrid technology, you've got the engine as well as the battery and the electric motor and powertrain. So it's complicated to be able to offer high performance sports cars at a low cost or a relatively low cost. So I'm fully behind Lotus on this one. I think they've got a great idea, and I would love to see a lot of the other supercar and hypercar manufacturers follow suit. And now from Lotus to Lucid. The small Silicon Valley startup this week announced their official reveal date for the Lucid Air all-electric sedan. In a press release, they said, quote, Today we are pleased to share the new date of our global reveal on September 9th, 2020, when we will share many details about the production Lucid Air, including pricing and specifications during a groundbreaking online digital reveal. Please stay tuned for information about this special online event, which we hope you will attend. We are proud of our entire Lucid team who continue to rise to the challenge of this unprecedented time and have found new ways to keep working towards our goals. We can assure you that our productivity has continued undiminished. We have, in fact, welcomed over 160 new Lucid team members in the past 90 days alone, and we are in the midst of a phased return to our Silicon Valley headquarters in accordance with local and state guidelines, along with our own strict protocols designed to protect the health and safety of all Lucid employees. We are also happy to report that our beta prototype fleet has resumed its comprehensive road and track testing program and continues the Lucid Air's drive towards production. Construction of our Casa Grande, Arizona factory, the first purpose-built EV production facility in the U.S., continues with astonishing speed, and we have stayed on schedule for completion later this year. Factory structures are fully enclosed by roofs and walls, and we have been installing major manufacturing components and brand new production equipment over the past month. Our dream is coming ever closer to reality, and we could not be more eager to show you the game-changing Lucid Air and what it means for the future of sustainable transportation. Now, there's a lot to unpack in that, but first and foremost, I want to give credit to the entire Lucid team for working their butts off to come as far as they have. It is really quite an achievement already. But let's dive into that a little bit. I think that it is great that they are doing an online event. I think in these times, it's very safe and smart to make a decision to not have a public gathering that potentially could be canceled or postponed. 
Now, I'm not sure exactly what specifications they haven't revealed yet about the Lucid Air. Of course, they have talked already about the 400 mile range and the 0 to 60, less than three seconds, a uh, top speed of 200 miles an hour or so, uh, which are staggering in of themselves. But I can't imagine that any reveal event is going to necessarily surprise us with some additional information about what the car is capable of. It is great to hear that the factory and the team and everybody is still moving forward, working towards the common goal of getting this car to production and into the hands of future customers. So this is one event in September I am definitely going to look forward to, and certainly as they release more information about the specifics of how to attend uh, digitally, of course, then I will get all of that information to you. Now on to some news about Tesla. Of course, we are familiar with the Model S. It has been their flagship vehicle since 2012, so it's almost been in production for an entire decade. And since its beginnings with a very humble range of less than 300 miles, we have seen that incrementally increase over the years to earlier this year, it was rated at 391 miles. If I remember correctly, I'd previously shared with you all that Tesla and Elon specifically had a little bit of an exchange with the EPA after, according to them, the EPA had tested the vehicle incorrectly by leaving the door open overnight with the key inside, allowing the battery to drain by 2%. Now, the EPA denied the claims that they had inappropriately, but of course, Tesla has all of the data to show and back up what was done. So the natural resolution to this would be, of course, for the EPA to redo the test without allowing that to happen. Well, they have now done that, and the new EPA rating for the Model S is over 400 miles, actually 402 miles officially. So the Model S cars that have been manufactured since January have not actually changed themselves. It's just now we have a more accurate EPA estimate for their range. Either way, the Tesla Model S is now the first American-made electric vehicle to exceed 400 miles, and that is a major milestone and certainly something worthy of celebrating for Tesla. The rideshare company Lyft announced Wednesday that it is committing to having 100% electric vehicles on its platform by 2030, a move that, according to an article by Green Tech Media, seeks to get out ahead of new emissions regulations under development in California. Sam Ahrens, director of sustainability at Lyft, said in an interview with Green Tech Media that they are taking a big step forward leading the industry and, and helping to meet the climate challenge that faces us all. The new pledge will require transitioning all vehicles used on the Lyft platform to EVs or other zero emission technologies over the next decade. Lyft will have the ability to source EVs directly for its Express Drive rental car program its consumer rental car program, and its autonomous vehicle program. But the vast majority of vehicles used on Lyft's platform are driver-owned, which means that the ride-sharing company will also take a bigger role in facilitating the transition to EVs more broadly. This work will include connecting current Lyft drivers to existing EV incentive programs, as well as advocating for new incentive policies at various levels of government. It will involve negotiating with auto manufacturers to reduce EV prices and aggregating demand to help drive down costs across the supply chain. Lyft also plans to do more to connect drivers to current charging providers to help make EV charging infrastructure more ubiquitous and reliable. Sam Aarons continued to say, quote, if we can do all those things, we think we're going to get to the point probably somewhere around mid-decade as the battery cost curve keeps coming down, where it's going to be so compelling that drivers will want to do this. We can help everybody switch to an EV and have a better experience and have more net earnings than they would if they had continued to drive a gasoline vehicle. Now, coming from a history myself personally of doing a lot of ride sharing. In fact, at one point, that was pretty much all I was doing to earn income was driving for Lyft and Uber. I can tell you that fuel economy in those vehicles means actual dollars earned. Because as a Lyft driver, you are responsible for covering your own fuel costs. So then transitioning away from gasoline not only saves you all of the money from those fuel costs, but of course the maintenance involved as well. Bottom line is that if you are a ride-sharing driver, 
if you've got an EV, especially one that is going to be capable of having a range of 250 miles or more, you will end up with more money in your pocket at the end of the day. And I honestly, aside from the environmental argument for transitioning to EVs, I think the economic argument is probably the most compelling. Now, taking a step back to look at the bigger picture on this, of course, if you have rideshare drivers that are driving around electric vehicles, members of the general public are going to be exposed to EVs at a much greater rate and ask questions and the conversations that are going to be happening inside these cars are going to be centered around the technology and how great the electric vehicles are. This is a move that ultimately will help push the transition to sustainable transportation to get more and more people driving electric vehicles, even those that aren't Lyft drivers themselves. That is one of the biggest reasons why I think this is a huge move. And yes, they've got a decade to do it. And who knows what the landscape in the EV world is going to look like 10 years from now. But I think just by making the commitment to even announce something like this is really a step forward in the right direction and a push that is dramatically needed to help the world get over their addiction to fossil fuels and gas burning and transition to a healthier and more environmentally friendly form of transportation. Okay, so that's all for the news this week. I did have a two-part EV question submitted by Brianna Johnson. Thank you, Brianna. Um, and so I want to answer that question for you. She had asked, why did we see a, such a large gap between EVs in the early 1900s and late 1800s and now? And secondly, what is it going to take to get more people driving EVs as quickly as possible? Well, Brianna, that question is, especially the second part of it, is very true to my heart. It echoes the mission of what we're trying to do here with the EV resources, just get everybody driving electric vehicles, every vehicle on the road being uh, battery electric or zero emission. Um, but to answer the first part of the question, you know, why was there such a large gap between the EVs being the dominant technology for transportation back in the day, you know, when cars were first being built and now? And the big reason is cost and range, really. Battery technology back then was nowhere near what it was now. And EVs were very, very tethered to their ability to recharge the batteries. Um, what some could argue that they're very tethered to the ability to recharge the batteries now, but I think we have a lot more freedom when you're talking about 300 and 400 mile range cars. The big reason, though, was production costs. You know, back then, when Henry Ford, especially when Henry Ford had developed the production line, that mass assembly meant that they could produce gas-powered cars for a fraction of the cost of electric vehicles. And having the ability to transport gasoline was a lot easier than building the charging infrastructure out into rural areas where a lot of people lived. Now, the second part of your question is very easy for me to answer, and that is, you know, what's it going to take for more people to drive EVs as, and get there as quickly as possible? That's simple. It's exposure. It's knowledge. It's an understanding. Um, the biggest hurdles to EV adoption right now are ignorance and fear. You could argue that's the biggest hurdle towards anything that is going to be progressive and, and change the way we look at the world we live in. Ignorance being that people just don't know how great EVs are. They don't know that they're more fun to drive, that they save you a boatload of money on maintenance and ongoing cost of uh, just owning the vehicle on a month-to-month -month basis or year-to-year. -year, you spend so much less on EVs than on gas-powered cars. People don't know that. I tell people that all the time, and they are still shocked and surprised to hear that it's just, it's not something that is resonating with the general public quite yet. People don't really understand that they actually are more environmentally conscious than gas-powered cars. There's so many rumors and, and misinformation out there that EVs are worse for the environment, which we know at this point that that is just not true. They might have been at one point because the grid was very dirty 
and we didn't have a way of sourcing the materials needed for the batteries as well as recycling them and using them for second life projects like static storage, where now we have all of that. And it's continually getting better. The technology is improving. Electric cars are getting more and more efficient, both in how they're made, but also how we use them. So they're getting better for the environment even then. So you've got the environmental aspect, people just don't know. You've got the economic aspect, people don't know. You have the fact that they are just a lot more fun. The one argument against adopting EVs that honestly uh, I tend to agree with slightly is the noise factor that, hey, you know, there are performance cars out there that just make a really nice sound. And with an EV, you don't get that sound. And while that's true, I have found for myself and also talking with many other people that are EV owners, that when you're driving your car, your EV, you don't even think about that sound of an engine. It's out of sight, out of mind, really, or out of ears, out of mind. You just don't think about it anymore. You don't miss it. And more and more, I'm running up against situations where somebody else has a very loud car and it's just annoying. <laughs> so that might be something that uh, even those people that refuse to get an EV because they won't have the nice V8 or V10 or, or honestly, if they've got it, a V12 in their car, that, that nice sound, um, I think they are going to realize that those vehicles are going to be reserved for a very special place in our lives. And it's not going to be what gets us to and from work or to the store. I hope that rant, <laughs> expanded rant, uh, I hope that answers your question, I, uh, both parts of it, really. And I want to thank you for submitting that. If any of you have a question about EVs or electrification or the transition to sustainable transportation, I encourage you to submit those via email at hello at ev-resource.com, and I will do my best to give you the most accurate and up-to-date answer, at least to the best of my ability. So before I go, I definitely want to wish all of the fathers out there a very happy Father's Day. Your hard work for your kids is definitely worthy of recognition. I do want to thank everybody who supports this show, whether it's just by listening or if you do like it and you're sharing it with your friends and other people you think are interested in electric vehicles, uh, that is great. In addition, those that are supporting us on Patreon, I absolutely give my unconditional gratitude for all of that. Watching is one thing, actually giving your hard earned dollars is a completely different level and I don't take that for granted at all. I invite you to come say hi on all social medias, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or on them all. And leave a comment or like on the YouTube channel as well if you feel so compelled. It is an absolute pleasure being able to put this together for you all week after week and I thank you for the opportunity to be able to do so. So thank you very much for being with me and I'll catch you next week. Oh,